supervisor for USA Kilts since 2011, with a degree in anthropology and many years of historical reenactment under his belt. Eric is a lifelong history nerd, and he is passionate about Celtic and Norse culture, and his research into Celtic fashion and customs is featured in usakilts.com. Uh, Eric. Good day. So, um, I want to start by inviting, if anybody wants to come a little closer, make this a little more intimate, please feel free, but stay in the shade by all means. That's why I moved everything over here a little bit, because it is bloody hot. Um, yeah, in Scotland, there's a joke that when you say good morning, it basically just means that it's not raining. And we pretty much have the opposite here. So, that's, yeah. I, I appreciate you all coming out and dealing with the heat. So, what I want to try and briefly describe to you is how we went from this right here to this over here and what I'm wearing now, or what any of you guys in the audience are wearing now. So let me start off with a couple of basic questions. You will be graded on your answers. <laughs> Number one, did William Wallace wear a kilt? Raise your hands, yes or no? Yes? yes. Did William Wallace wear a kilt? The answer is no. Okay. Now, how about uh, Rob Roy? Does anybody know who Rob Roy was? Yes. Did Rob Roy wear a kilt? Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So, basically, we're talking about a difference between the Middle Ages with William Wallace and the 17th and 18th century with Rob Roy and uh, may I, maybe I could say uh, Jamie Frazier. Anybody here familiar with a guy named Jamie Frazier? Okay. Okay. Um, that is the high point of when this whole kilting thing really hits the ground running. The earliest reference we have to anybody wearing a kilt, documentable reference, is 1574. So a lot of people think that it's this ancient garment that goes back to like the Bronze Age. That's only half true, okay? And for the most part, it's we, we just can't prove anything like that was being used in that capacity earlier than the 16th century. Now, I can start this off, let's see. Would anyone like to dress like a really primitive kelp for a couple of seconds? Let's see. Uh, you, sir, at the back. The green shirt. Come on up. Well, come on, I haven't got all day. All right. I've never used a microphone like this before. This is an interesting luxury. All right. So we're going to say that you're basically a Celt from anywhere between 324 AD to maybe 1500. And it's cold outside. Make yourself warm. Yep. Any way you can. Just try and make yourself warm. Yep. Yeah. Pretend, pretend it's Scottish weather. Exactly. Go ahead and face these guys. Okay. He's actually done exactly what most people were doing in the Middle Ages, which is covering up what he's already wearing. As you can see, he's wearing a perfectly accurate medieval tunic and breeches, okay, and bog shoes, um, which were designed to let the water run out. And, but it's cold and it's misty and yucky out, so he's going to wrap himself up in this. That is called a brat, otherwise known as a cloak. And something like that was worn basically for hundreds and hundreds of years since Roman times up until, you know, the Renaissance. The problem is, as we got better at weaving wool and making tighter weaves and producing wool in bulk, the brats were really popular and useful, so they got bigger and bigger and bigger. So eventually you got to the point where this was kind of a pain to have wrapped around your shoulder like that. So here, hold this incredibly medieval microphone. <laughs> so let's, uh, how can we make this more convenient? Let's see. No, no stealing of the microphone. <laughs> That's a little more. That's a little more convenient, right? Just throw a belt on like that. Now, no, he can't, can he? Well, how about you just kind of throw this over the like that? That's a little more convenient, right? Okay, but you know, you're not always going to want to have it like that. So maybe you're going to try and pleat it up in the back, so it's even more convenient. So the bulk of the fabric is out of your way, but it gives you some nice padding back there when you have to sit down on the heat. And then, uh, you know, you still have some excess flapping over here. So you're just going to try and bring it up over one side, kind of like that. Okay? 
Now this is obviously a really cheesy demonstration. And imagine it really magnificent brooch right there. That's where all this started. Okay, that's fine. It's a, it's 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 not my fault. So that's basically it. Thanks. Okay. So the brat became known as. Do I know the Gaelic term for a kilt? Anyone? Philip Moore. Okay. Philip Moore or a bracken na fila, and my Gaelic is horrible, so please forgive me if my pronunciation is bad, um, was basically this guy right here. The idea was you had a bunch of yardage of cloth, which had probably been woven by a family member, and dyed using whatever natural dyes were in your area, in your region of the country, and you wrapped it around yourself and belted it to keep it convenient, and you could use the excess as a hood, bring it up over the top, you could leave volumes of the fabric loose here to use as a pocket. You could wrap it all the way over your shoulders as a cloak, and you could use it as a sleeping bag. Um, a really great example of this, again, it's a favorite movie of mine, so I'll probably mention it more than once today, is Rob Roy from the 1990s. The garb there is pretty accurate for the time period, and you see guys basically out there on the hillside just wrapping up in the cloaks, wrapping up in their great, their great kilts or belted plaids. Now, you're familiar with the word plaid, right? What does plaid mean? Anybody, what, what do you think when you think, think of the word plaid? The pattern. The pattern? Like the stripes? Yeah. Square. That's the usual misconception. Plaid or plaid actually refers to fabric. Okay? The term for the pattern, the crisscross stripes, is tartan. And that's not the original word. The original word was bracken, which I'm probably mispronouncing. And that's the Gaelic word. Tartan was originally a French word from the 16th century, tiens, which basically referred to a wool and linen blend fabric. Well, Lindsay Woolsey, if anybody here does fabric, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Somewhere along the line, people got the idea of calling it tartan when they're referring to the fabric with the, the pattern woven into it. So essentially, mixing your colors like this with the threads goes back thousands and thousands of years. Any civilized, settled culture where they did weaving you'll find some example of using different color threads in the warp and the weft of the cloth to make a pattern like this. We have the honor and the distinction of having done it the best. So <laughs> that's that's why everybody thinks of tartan or plaid uh, as a Celtic thing, okay? But the oldest plaid or tartan that we found actually goes back to about 3000 BC in Northern China. Now the earliest plaid that we know of, the earliest tartan that we know of, from Celtic lands is what's called the Falkirk Tartan. It was named after the village of Falkirk where the sample was found. And it's what's called a shepherd's check. Shepherd's check, um, you know what chef's pants look like? Kind of like that black and white checkery kind of kind of pattern. You know what I mean? Like you see waiters and stuff wearing sometimes. That's what it looks like. And the way they made it was having wool from a white sheep and wool from a black sheep and weaving them together to make this tiny, tiny, tiny little check pattern. And that has since been named Shepherd Check, okay? So you don't necessarily think of it as a Celtic thing, but it really is. Now, when we went from that tiny little check pattern and its simplicity up to something fancy like this, or what I'm wearing, is just a constant evolution, all right? You don't have to have a fancy looking tartan to be uh, an authentic part tartan, and a simple tartan can be equally authentic. Back in the day, it was just a matter of what you could afford. And the big part of the cost was the dyes. Now, let's remember Jamie Frazier, we were talking about him. In the series Outlander, he has a very sedate, very earthy looking tartan, right? That was not uncommon. But to some extent, in a lot of movies, we will go for the old, rustic, you know, worn down looking colors in a tartan because we think it looks more medieval, it looks more romantic. The truth of the matter is, you spent as much money as you could afford on the dyes to make your cloth. So you had two ways to play it. One would be cheap, simple colors, which would be good for something like camouflage. A lot of earthy tartans were great if you wanted to hide in the heather when the English or somebody else was coming. You could basically lie down, flip your kilt over your head, and you're camouflaged, instant camouflage. Or times are more peaceful, you have more money, you're gonna throw as much money as you can into your cloth because you've always showed off your wealth by your clothing. And that's where the really, really bright colors come in. And in all honesty, a lot of time if you see kilts in Hollywood, they're really sedate compared to what people were really wearing. 
Okay? So that's, that's part of how all of this evolved. So, any questions so far? Natural vegetable dye uh, dyes would fade with time over this over yeah, it's because of sun and everything. That is part of it too, yeah. If you didn't have a lot of money, you wouldn't necessarily replace your cloth very often, so you're more likely to have faded cloth. Nowadays, we actually sell that to you uh, as a feature, not a bug, basically called weathered and uh, muted tartans, the idea being that it looks like it's been aged. So it gives you a nice sedate feel to it. So oh, that's the tartan itself. I'll take one more question, and then I'm going to keep rolling here. Yeah. That's, that's the next, I'm going to talk, finish, I'll answer your question and talk about the cloth and then we'll talk about how we went from this monster to something a little easier to wear. Clan tartans are a relatively modern invention and by modern I mean the late 18th, early 19th century. That is the result of the, uh, anybody ever heard of the uh, restrictions on tartan in the 18th century? Okay, after the Battle of Culloden when the English king, you know, put the uh, prescriptions in place. It lasted about 32, 30 years or so. Once that was lifted, everybody went nuts for tartan. Everybody had to have tartan. And the uh, one of the first things that happened was that the, the mill started producing more of it, and people came in to buy it, and people with, who were landed gentry specifically wanted to have a tartan that uh, they could outfit their entire household in. That's in, in broader terms, that's called livery. It's basically the uniform that your staff has. And so, say I'm, you know, the Earl of Campbell or something, and I come into Wilson's of Bannockburn, which is the oldest mill at the time, and say, well, I need X number of yards for these guys. What have you got? Well, we got this one. Okay, that's fine. And they'd write the name down, and the name would stick, because that was what they bought. They would also market it. The mills very quickly caught on that because now that uh, the prescriptions were lifted and that there was no fear of actual rebellion, in the country, then now we can all be romantic and uh, heartthrobby about Highland culture. If we start naming our cloth with names of famous heroes or famous families, we can actually sell more of it. So a lot of tartans were named as a result of trying to get people to buy tartan. Now, just because it happened that way as a start doesn't mean it isn't incredibly important and incredibly worthy nowadays. Every tradition has to have a start somewhere, right? But the idea that there were clan identifier tartans going back into the Middle Ages or the Bronze Age is not true. It actually basically happens when Highland culture gets that big surge in the late 18th and early 19th century. And you can especially thank Queen Victoria for a lot of this stuff, including the clothing I'm about to talk about. Okay? So essentially, we talked about this is the, the classic keeping the rain off your back clothes that was common up through... Even up into the early uh, 19th century, people were still wearing stuff like this. At some point, the kilt gets cut in half. I mean, you don't see too many people around here walking around with big hunks of fabric over their shoulders. That's because it didn't take long for people to realize that this is a lot of bulk, and if you're not going to be out of doors all the time, you don't necessarily need all this bulk. So people started cutting it in half, and that was called the filibeg, or the walking kilt, sometimes called a day kilt. It's like a casual quilt. The earliest documented evidence of something like that that we have dates to, uh, let's see, where's my note? I always forget this date. Right, basically the 17, 1780s, the, I think the thing was discovered, but it supposedly refers to the 1720s when uh, a mill worker from Lancashire went north to Scotland to set up um, an ironworks and some other projects and supposedly found that the local labor were all wearing these great kilts and they couldn't work the machines properly because their fabric was getting in their way. So he went and had a kilt cut in half. He got some help from the uh, tailor for the local Scottish Highland Regiment, you know, the military unit that was nearby, and they invented, supposedly, what was called the short kilt. And it's the earliest documentation we have of a of a filibeg being sewn down, having the pleats sewn in the back like this. Were guys cutting kilts in half and just kind of 
pitch him up with a belt before that? Almost certainly. Absolutely. But if you hear somebody say, referring to this incident, that, well, an Englishman is responsible for inventing the Scottish kilt, that's not true. Not likely true. It's just the earliest documentable evidence we have of it. Okay? So, that's basically how you went from this bulk to something a bit more convenient. And as things got more and more settled over the next 100, 200 years, you started adding things into the outfit just to make it have Scottish national identity. Okay? One of the things that happened was that during the prescriptions, the only people who were legally allowed to wear tartan, people did, they were rebels and quiet and private homes who wore tartan. But in public, the only people who were allowed to wear tartan were soldiers, uh, units in the British Army. So, as a result of that, a lot of the military heirs of the uniforms at that time became associated with Highland culture, Scottishness, and all that, and they got incorporated into the uniforms. So, if you look at this jacket over here, shift to stage left, we have epaulettes, you can see on a military jacket. This cuff, which we call a Braemar cuff, actually goes back to the 18th century. You know, you can imagine uh, pictures of like the Founding Fathers in colonial America with jackets with decoration like that on it. And obviously, if you guys want to see this stuff up close when we're done talking, by all means, come and take a look. The waistcoat, basically Victorian. The scalloping on the pockets, again, this is a survival of fashions from the 18th and 19th century. And there's a lot of variety in the top half of Highland wear, the jackets and things, as a result of basically Scots being ornery and stubborn and wanting to hang on to stuff because it's theirs and they love it. And uh, the Victorians trying to turn this into a more gentlemanly, fashionable system of dress that you could use for any number of contexts, okay? So we have held on to elements of dress from 200, even 300 years ago because they're freaking cool. That's what it comes down to. Any questions now? No? Okay. So essentially, the Victorians are responsible for a lot of this look right here. Between the military evolution and Queen Victoria deciding that anything Scottish was awesome and doing things like demanding that if you were a Highland Lord, you were not allowed in her presence unless you were wearing your clan tartan and wearing your traditional Highland regalia. And I'm sure at some point there was some guy who said, you know, who was told, oh, well, you're going to have an audience with the Queen. He says, what? Oh, do you have to bring out your kilt and your dirk and all that stuff. What? <laughs> And suddenly people had, they had started to have to really ramp up making this stuff look amazing and regal and ceremonial. A good example is the hat I'm wearing. This is what's called modernly a Balmoral, named after the royal residence, Balmoral Castle. Okay? It is basically a Victorian... Oh my god! <laughs> they got him, they got Angus! <laughs> Um, Are you military? Okay? Got it. Oh, you'll be fine. Um, this, this is a, a. Is everybody recovered? Are you okay from that kind of shock? All right. Um, this is a survival of a, a hat which is just called a bonnet. Okay. This the, the basic Scottish utility hat worn by the working classes. It got turned into an aspect of the British military uniforms, and then that became a just a thing you wear. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate your help. You may have to, yeah, you may just have to pose there with him now. <laughs> <laughs> right. No. Hold on, they're going to take the picture. The difference being, back in the 16th through 18th century, this hat was a lot more practical. It was basically a big fabric bag, and you can actually wear it like a beret like this, although usually it was a little higher and a little more centered. Okay? So you would kind of form a, a, a rain brim, or... You can pull it down over your ears if you were cold and it was wet, okay? So this probably looks incredibly dorky, but this is what they did, okay? You could also just take it off and use it as a bag if you had to carry something. Very, very practical. All of this stuff is based at some point on practicality, even as froofy as it sometimes has gotten over the years to make it fun and nationalistic and romantic. Um, this started off as something very practical. Now it's just kind of a dashing military thing, and when I go through the mall wearing this, people think I'm a sailor. But uh, what are you going to do? So, <laughs> similarly, you have the sporin, which is the man bag, the purse, the merce, you know, the carry-all. I always tell ladies at the shop, if you want to call it a, a man bag or, oh, honey, you just bought your purse. <laughs> You're allowed to make that joke once. 
because <laughs> Sporan is actually Gaelic for purse. All right? That's what it is. In the Middle Ages up through the Renaissance, there were no pockets. You had to have something to carry all your gear in. This was the answer, no matter who you were. Okay? Now, a very simple Sporan might be like what this gentleman is wearing here. And then they get fancier like this. Let's see if I can not knock him over. With the decorative tassels and stuff. Nobody's quite sure why they did the tassels. It was just kind of a fashion thing they developed. People just really like the tassels. All the way up to the fancy horsehair sporns that you see pipe bands wearing. And 150 years ago, a lot of people wore those just because they looked cool. And especially if you had the money. So, would anybody care to guess what the main thing you would carry in your sporin back in the day was? Pass your minds back to the 17th, 18th century. Tell me what you would carry in your sporin. Gunpowder. Say? Gunpowder. Food. I hear food. Food is probably the best answer. Oats. Dried oats. Because um, a Highlander in military service or you know, on the march as a, you know, an uprising or something like that could march, I think the estimate is something like 20 miles a day on basically dry oats. That's what they ate. What they ate. What they ate. It's what they ate. Um, you know, maybe with some water to make a porridge if you could, but you know, sometimes you just bop it down while you're still marching. The other thing that would be mixed in with those oats probably would be musket balls. And maybe a few coins, but very often you'd hide the coins in other places on your person just to be safe. But it was very utilitarian. It still is. Um, for a long time, we've had bagpipers nowadays who are surprised that when we sell them a sporin, it's actually a functional piece of equipment because they're used to decorative sporins where it's just a piece of cardboard back there. Is it supposed to look cool? But no, sporin is a wholly practical thing. So that's uh, that's some of the main points. And I could go on and on and on ad nauseum about this stuff, but I want to open this up to questions and answers since we theoretically have 10 minutes left. So, yes. No, you. Me, okay. Yeah. I was you pointed over, it wasn't true. Uh, I know we're focusing on the Scottish kilt. Uh -huh. How does the Irish kilt play into the time frame? It's a great question. Um, kilts are pretty much a Scottish thing up until about 1900. The, uh, there's, there is a lot of, uh, there have been some assumptions and romantic thinking and misconceptions that the Irish had invented a kilt, but the pictorial evidence we have indicates that most likely what that actually you see in in the wood blocks and the stone carvings was something called a lena or lean. I probably mispronounced it, and I apologize for all the Gaelic speakers out there. Uh, in English, that's the war shirt. It was a long tunic which was worn throughout the Celtic lands, basically went down to your knees. In fact. Typically in Scotland, when you're going to go into battle, you would ditch this bulky thing and just run into battle wearing the shirt. Because it's basically a tunic. You know, it basically goes all the way down your knees, it's covering everything, and it's, you don't need this bulk if you're about to do a Highland charge. Um, so the Irish developed a form of the lane uh, with very long, foofy sleeves. It's very distinctive, as was the saffron dye that they used, especially for the royal houses. So it was a mark of uh, wealth and aristocracy in Ireland in the Middle Ages if you had the very big sleeves because you could afford the fabric. And it was bright yellow because you could afford the dye. Kilts, like we're used to, like with the pleats and all this and the plaids and all that, don't come to Ireland until the Nationalists. Basically, the Nationalist school, around 1900, 1905, somewhere in there, they started adopting kilts as part of their efforts to boost Gaelic culture and Gaelic pride. So the very first kilt in Ireland was, guess what color? Green. Green. Nope. Try again. Saffron. Close. Blue. For St. Patrick. Because in, in, in Catholicism, blue is the official color of St. Patrick. So in the Nationalist School, you had all these kids learning Irish dance wearing blue kilts. Um, if you look at our website in our blog section, we actually have a photograph of it. Um, then Saffron came in because it was used by British military units around World War I or so. Um, and I'm sketching on this part of the history, so if I'm wrong, please send us a comment on Facebook and make sure I'm right. Um, then the tartans for Irish kilts came in only about basically, what, 1990s, right? Yeah, basically very recently. And uh, that's why there isn't so much a, a clan family system for Irish kilts, but there is a county system. So we'll typically tell you over here at the tent, if you want to know what tartan your family would be wearing, find out what county your family came from. And that's basically your best bet to have a nice looking kilt. But the other thing is, you can wear whatever you want. The rule of thumb I tell people is, you don't go to a private clan gathering and try to pass yourself off as a member, that's just rude. 
but just because I wear a Phillies ball cap doesn't mean I'm a member of the Phillies. Okay, it just means I like the Phillies. So remember, the whole clan tartan thing is it only goes back to mostly the Victorians. So you could wear whatever tartan your wife had happened to weave that winter. Okay, or you know, using whatever dyes were available in your region. Does that help? Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, we didn't shatter any weird, you know, <laughs> notions. But again, just because a tradition is new or starts in, in any kind of circumstance doesn't mean it isn't legit. It is as legitimate as you choose to make it to be and as much pride as you just choose to put into it. Okay? That's what this is all about. Okay, anybody else? Yes? Uh, I'm not going to get undressed for you. She asked if I could demonstrate how you put the kilt on. Um, what I am going to do is ask you if you would be so kind to pass these around. I have these very ancient Scottish uh, visual aids, um, one of which is a basic diagram on how you wrap the great kilt. Uh, I see the wind didn't take it away. Correct. Basically, you would lay the fabric out, and you'd uh, pull the pleats into it, and then lay down on top and wrap it around yourself. Now, some people will tell you that that's all they did. There is evidence that they actually, at some point in the 17th century, figured out, you know, this would be a lot easier if there was a drawstring in here, so I don't have to do these pleats every single time. So we have, uh, and in fact, there's a great kilt from 1822, which is really late for great kilt period, but it has belt loops on the inside. So you can just run a, like a, a rope belt, you know, a string belt through that, lie down, whoop, and the pleats are already done. And then you put on your weapons belt on the outside afterwards. So they weren't dumb, and they do did know that sometimes they were going to be in a hurry. But basically, yes, you would lie down and wrap it around yourself, and then do the, the flip over the shoulder, or any number of other ways, depending on what the weather was like. People slept in their clothes a lot. The whole, the whole idea of having bed covers is kind of, you know, kind of modern in some ways. Anybody else? Uh, well, I guess somebody, anybody from the back? I don't want to diss you guys. You, ma'am. I can't quite hear you. Symbolism of the pom pom. I wish I knew. That is, that's one question I myself have right now. Um, they were not always contrasting colors. Um, I think it was basically just a decoration, and when it was a knitted cap back in the old days, it may have just been, you know, that you took the leftover yarn or woolen, you know, the thread, not the thread, it could be yarn, and just turned it into a, a puff because that was how you finished the hat. Now, symbolism on the hat. The most important symbolism on the hat is right there. Now, modernly, I'm wearing a clan badge on that. I'm a Stuart, so that's a Stuart badge. This was uh, one of the ways you differentiated your troops on the battlefield. And if, have they talked about, have they got the whole Jacobite thing going in the Outlander series? I've actually not watched the whole thing. Okay, okay. If they did, and they did it right, the Jacobites are all wearing blue bonnets with a white ribbon in a cross on it. And that was the symbol that they were part of the uprising, that they were part of the, you know, the prince's army. Um, you would also stick things like feathers, bracken, not bracken, uh, local weeds, flowers, things like that, in the ribbon here, stuck through the side, to differentiate your guy versus the other guys on the battlefield. Does that make sense? Okay, anybody else? Sir. If William Wallace didn't wear a kilt, what did he wear? Basically, you want to look at uh, any images of knights from that period. It's basically what, 14th, 15th century, um, 14th century. Google images for a 14th century knight. He would have been wearing basically probably a padded halberd or a tunic, or what we're recently calling a lane, you know, a war shirt, down to the knees. He'd be wearing trues, which are basically you know close-fitting leggings, um, some kind of leather shoes, and male armor with steel helm and other pieces of parts like that. Um, the, you've seen the movie Bra Braveheart? Who hasn't seen the movie Braveheart, right? Um, the English are dressed more accurately for the time period in that movie than the Scots are. So if you look at those goofy helmets that they got on, the rather suggestive goofy helmets, um, that's actually what Wallace probably was wearing. He was, he was not poor and he was a military commander. He would have been armored properly to survive the battle. And he would have had armor from the time. Right? Exactly. Now, the uh, did he ever wear a brat, like we were talking about at the beginning? You know, a cloak in tartan fabric? Very possibly. Um, again, we don't have any pictorial evidence, so we can't be sure, but we're pretty sure he wasn't running around in blue paint. You know, blue wove. So, does that help? Yeah. Okay. Last question. 
Roman soldiers, we see them depicted multiple times in, in, in movies. Were they, did they have a similar thing to the modern kill? The Romans? Yes, Roman soldiers. <clears throat> when, you're looking, when you're looking at uh, Romans or most medieval people, you're basically seeing the bottom end of the tunic. It's just, it's belted in, so it's flaring out a bit. Uh, Romans weren't really big on pants, um, but they had long tunics. And in a Mediterranean climate, that makes, makes a lot of sense. Now, when they moved into northern climes, like in Britain, they would adopt some of the local clothing, and they'd be wearing pants and such, uh, trues again, uh, because of the environment. It's cold, you want to keep your legs warm. Unless you're Scott, you're a little bit crazy. <laughs> it's not, sometimes, it, there are some very practical reasons for a kilt, and there are some other times when you think, why did they do this? Um, it, I, and nobody knows for sure what proportion it is versus national identity or practicality. I think a lot of it was practicality because of the environment. Um, that's a whole other topic. Anybody else? Anyone? Anyone? I guess that's it. And I think my time is technically up. If anybody has any further questions or wants to chat, I'll be over here for a couple minutes. Or feel free to come by the tent at USA Kilt, and we can do more there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Eric. Um, as you can see, the uh, Celtic classic is far more than just Celtic bands and beer drinking and highland dancing. It's about promoting the Celtic culture and learning about that. And as you see with Eric just now, we have two more coming up today. Um, at 2.15, we have a presentation on wild Irish women. And then later on at 3.45, we have Dave Ambrose is presenting information about the flags of the seven Celtic nations. So stick around. We'll be back in about 15 minutes with the next presentation.